Greetings, faithful viewer. My, you are looking striking today, may I? Wait a minute. Are you? Are you high? Don't lie to me. I can smell it on you. Let me tell you something. As a trash can that's been around the block, a wise man once said to me, you don't want to sell me death sticks. His name, Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's you right there. That's you, faithful viewer. You're Sleaze Bagano. You don't want to be him. If only there was a simulator of some sort that can show you how to be more like Obi-Wan. Wait a minute. Is that Star Wars Obi-Wan on the original Xbox over there? Why, why, yes it is. When the first Xbox came out, it was always this mysterious big boy console to me, this monster energy drink looking powerhouse meant only for adults who like to drink bad devil juice and play Halo. Like most kids at the time, I had a PS2 and as a major Star Wars fan, I was so envious of all the console exclusive Xbox games. Clearly this Xbox was this advanced machine, the only console at the time that could handle these types of games, and even this mysterious weird one just called Obi-Wan. Yeah, look at that green and black to match perfectly with the Xbox color scheme. Damn, if only Star Wars had a character with a green lightsaber or maybe green skin who we could make the star of our Xbox exclusive Star Wars game. Like my man Benny Q. Oh, I love this cover. It's so on brand for the attitude of the original Xbox. It looks like it was conjured from the Green Mountain Dew fusion of the Xbox startup logo itself. The original Xbox launched in late 2001 and a few weeks after we got Star Wars Obi-Wan, a game that's largely been forgotten and overshadowed by the pantheon of amazing Star Wars games that came out in the early 2000s. I never hear anything about this one and surely an exclusive early Star Wars game would be a big draw for a brand new system, but most early Xbox hype and talk was about Mr. Master Chief instead. Not only is Star Wars Obi-Wan relatively obscure for what it is, it's also a game that's largely inaccessible to most today. It's one of the few Star Wars games from that time that isn't backwards compatible on the Xbox One, and it isn't even compatible on the 360. And seeing as both the GameCube and PS2 versions were both cancelled, the only way you're playing this one is with the original Xbox. Now it's time to put to the test whether Star Wars Obi-Wan truly lives up to its name. <gasps> there he is! There he is again! No way. Well, I think I've seen enough. This game is straight facts. In this game, you play as young Mr. McGregor himself as Padawan Obi-Wan traveling the galaxy, taking down CD gangs on Coruscant and battle droids galore. And with controlling, Rat Tail Kenobi comes lightsaber combat and force powers as one would expect, but the execution is actually pretty damn impressive for a game that's been largely forgotten. Most early 3D Star Wars games either stuck you with a blaster or saw you in the cockpit of a starfighter, since once you bring Jedi into the mix, it tends to raise a lot of complicated design choices. How do you make the player feel like a true Jedi? How do you give the player agency with their lightsaber and force powers and still make the game balanced and challenging? How do we get to do a lot of the cool things we saw in the movie? It's a lot to juggle and it's been a question raised since the Atari 2600 days to eventually evolving to the more intricate combat of, say, Jedi Academy. Properly designing this kind of gameplay takes a lot of work and is very challenging. In Star Wars Obi-Wan, it was one of the first Star Wars console games to give you direct control of how your lightsaber swings, which is all done with the right analog stick. It's pretty simple, offering you three directions, left, right, and up, while down is reserved for blocking attacks and lasers. This could have easily been a mess and felt super unsatisfying, but because it's so simple, it actually feels pretty dang good. Your attacks feel appropriately heavy yet graceful, blocking lasers feels nice and snappy, and of course there's also the Force. What's the Force, you ask? Well, Luke, the Force is a blue, glowy thing that appears under your feet and lets me do whatever the hell I want, like burning people. All your force powers are done by holding the left trigger, which sort of acts like a modifier for all your other attacks. It makes your lightsaber swings more powerful, your jumps higher, you can disarm enemies, lob objects and explosives in the environment, and you also got this really satisfying force push. Obi-Wan can also perform a lightsaber throw, and what's really cool is you can control where it travels in the environment, slicing multiple enemies at once. Sometimes the lightsaber would even get caught on something and take forever to get back in my hand like Thor's hammer. Oh, also Obi-Wan can just slow down time. Uh, this wasn't really too useful, but it definitely helped in certain later parts of the game. So the move set here is pretty damn extensive and can seem like a lot, but it all controls very well and it's nice to finally feel appropriately overpowered. But because of that, it's very tempting and easy to get overzealous and find yourself bombarded. 
If you're not too careful, you're going to die quicker than Ayla Sakura with her back turned. Your health can deplete quickly, and so can your force meter. You can't just block forever. And a lot of the early instances of when I died was not because of the game's difficulty, but because of my meathead brain wanting to rush into things. You'll also be occasionally doing enemies one-on-one -on -one in lightsaber combat, and I actually really enjoyed when the game slowed down for more of these focus duels. I don't know, maybe it was just walking around through this Naboo palace setting, doing these one-on-one -on -one duels with that lock-on system and dodge rolling and parrying attacks, but I was slowly starting to be reminded of another game. A little one called Dark Souls. Don't say it. Don't you dare say it. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of this game's combat feels very, uh, uh, reminiscent of a simplified, uh, uh, a Jedi Fallen Order. Yeah. Very good, voiceover Junko. Very good. Proceed. It's interesting. You can't interact with the Force and environmental objects with the same detail and say, the Force Unleashed, and the control of your lightsaber swings is nowhere near as complex as a game like Jedi Outcaster Academy, and the actual one-to-one -one combat is definitely not as tightly designed and flashy as something like Jedi Fallen Order. But Star Wars Obi-Wan offers a simplified combination of many of these kind of ideas, and I can't help but be impressed at how well executed some of this was for a launch title in 2001. Dioxys gas! Poison! They must be dead by now, but make certain. Check it out, Corporal. Roger, roger. Eventually, the game's plot begins to overlap with The Phantom Menace and be a loose retelling of that movie. When this bad bitch over here with the pretty eyes says, Sir, they've got climbed into a ventilation shaft. You know damn well you and Qui-Gon are climbing up those vents. Notably absent from this retelling of episode one is Jar Jar and little boy Anakin, who only briefly shows up in the final scene. <laughs> Yoda is only in this game for a hot second, and he looks like McChicken Lettuce. The Obi-Wan impression sounds like he has a nose full of space boogers. But Master Yoda says I should be mindful of the future. Visually, this game has got this weird clash of styles. I think it's just some weird shading, but Obi-Wan's backside looks almost cell shaded like he's pulled out of Breath of the Wild. Within gameplay, the animations look really good, like smashing these droids into pieces in, in these environments is really cool in motion. Back off! I'm warning you! The earlier areas of the game see you on Coruscant slicing through gang members, and man, just looking at this now, I, I know for a fact I would have loved this game as a kid. What's up, Coruscant? You're listening to 1313 Radio, bringing you the galaxy's greatest jams right here to Coruscant. Alawa Kuni Tang! Bum to the bum to the bum to the bass, bum to the bum to the bum bum. All the levels, while linear, are surprisingly large and open. They just have this nice illusion of vastness to them. It's weird because sometimes there's alternate paths you can take, but other times th there's just doors and hallways that don't really lead to anything. They're just detours or more enemies you can skip over. While this sounds frustrating, I thought it was actually kind of interesting to see. Oh gee guys, look, a big red laser door as if that's ever gonna be a problem. Oh fuck. Once the game overlaps with the story of Phantom Menace, that's where I found while things were picking up, stuff was starting to annoy me. Being able to just shred through these battle droids like butter like they do in the movies was fun, but your objectives quickly devolve into escort missions where you'll be bombarded by enemies and one clumsy random blaster shot will set you back. Remember the short scene where Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon jump down this balcony all badass and slaughter everything in sight? Here a single sneeze will make the queen die if she isn't already being suicide bombed. Okay, see, this wouldn't normally be a problem. If I messed up, I'll just try again. Except this game gives you limited attempts for each level. Why? This does not belong in a game like this. It makes every poorly designed section much more frustrating because you know you're just one cheap death or accident away from losing so much progress. There were one or two instances where I ended up losing like half an hour of progress, all because of some terribly designed section of the game. Obi-Wan, uh, uh, the Jedi, for some reason can take fall damage. I guess when you're a Padawan, they don't teach you how to stop yourself from breaking your knees. There's this one section here where if you didn't notice this random bush you were supposed to fall down onto, you'll be screwed. I didn't even see this bush the first few times, so I went around the level doing some exploring and I found a sewer grate you could interact with. There you go, that must be where you have to- Also, in this game, aside from your lightsaber, you get these items. Obi-Wan Kenobi gets a goddamn sniper. I've got to learn how to do that. 
And what's really cool about these larger levels is there are a few instances where you can interact with later areas of the game. Like here in this nighttime level on Naboo, I was able to get this vantage point here and be able to take out these snipers from far, far away. So when I got to that section way later in the game, they weren't a problem anymore. Stuff like this is only really possible once or twice, but when it did happen, I was pretty astonished the developers included it. Like really, how many people were ever going to notice that? Between each of these levels, you take on a Jedi Master on the Council in the sparring session. They're pretty easy and straightforward boss fights like, ooh gee, is that Saisi Tin? Dude, all you know how to do is stand there and die, I don't think you're gonna be that much of a problem. The last Jedi you take on is Mace Windu, and get ready for this. Hey, is that purple? <laughs> As far as I know, this was the first appearance of Mace Windu's purple blade outside of a comic. I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% certain, so all you diehard Star Wars fans, please be a little understanding if I end up being wrong. They were not. In episode one, the movie on Tatooine, Obi-Wan really has nothing to do during these scenes except wait around. I guess that's what they call poetry. So for the game, they come up with this bizarre side mission where the queen gets kidnapped by Tusken Raiders and at the dead of night, you go out and slaughter all the men, women, and children. Jesus Christ, Anakin, you had nothing to hide this whole time. Your master's been doing this shit since you were in the fourth grade. This game came out in December 2001, so a couple of months before Attack of the Clones. I'm guessing the developers weren't made aware of this particular scene. But there's this part in this level where you see this mural of a bunch of Tuskens surrounding a Jedi. But it's not clear whether this is referring to Obi-Wan being there at that moment slaughtering them. Like, did some Tusken Raider just draw all those stick figures around the wall really fast? Or is it a prediction of events to come many years later? Someone from LucasArts, you must contact me. I need to know the right answer, please. Wikipedia doesn't have anything on this. This level here is easily my favorite in the entire game. I just love the cold, dead atmosphere of it all. Fighting the Tusken Raiders feels much more personal since you fight them in smaller packs, you can light them on fire with their own camps, they can do the same to you and you can dodge roll a bunch to put the fire out, that's such a nice little touch. Eventually you make your way through the Tusken tombs where you'll finally reach the boss fight with the Tusken Chieftain, Mano Amano, a test of sheer skill and strength, Jedi learner versus warrior of the sand and I messed up so bad I had to just run around the room throwing shit at him like a domestic dispute. Still my favorite boss fight. I have defeated your war chief. Allow me to return to my ship safely with the queen. That's not fair, dude. You totally cheese him. Be quiet, Gary. The last boss of the game, of course, is Duel of the Fates man himself, Darth Maul. Uh-oh, a big red laser door. What's gonna happen? I hope you are more challenging than your master. I'm somewhat disappointed in him. Back <laughs> off. I'm warning you. He said, you cannot win. So after you beat Maul, the game ends and you get to do a big battle royale with every Jedi Master just for fun. Oh, and in the end credits, Obi-Wan does that monologue from Train Spotting. Choose the Force. Choose a job. Choose the dark side. Choose the council. Choose a flubbing big lightsaber. I chose not to choose the dark side. And that's pretty much all there is to Star Wars Obi-Wan. I was kind of surprised it ended there. All of the loading screens show images of Obi-Wan from Episode 2 and Episode 4, so I thought this game was actually going to chronicle some stuff outside of his days as a Padawan. I really was expecting some bonus level or something, of getting to fight Darth Vader on the Death Star, or maybe a sneak peek Episode 2 level. Like, come on, let us play as Obi-Wan, you're teasing him right there! Even with a few frustrating moments and wonky presentations, Star Wars Obi-Wan is pretty impressive for all the seeds of other ideas that were later expanded upon in other Star Wars games. And I think even though the lightsaber and force combat are very simple, it's still admirable how they tried to give the player more direct control in terms of being a Jedi. Keep in mind, this game came out a few months before Jedi Outcast, and the only real frame of reference for gameplay like this was Dark Forces 2 on the PC. So it was interesting to see LucasArts pull off something like this decently on a console. By an absolutely no stretch of the imagination is this game some hidden masterpiece, but I do think there is value in preserving this game with some sort of HD port, or maybe one day Microsoft can release it digitally or make it backwards compatible, something. For now, the only way to play this game in the foreseeable future is with an original Xbox. So, faithful viewer, perhaps you should seek out one and a copy of this game, and maybe, just maybe, be more like Obi-Wan.